Okay, that's chapter 18. Chapter 19, the end of human history. That's what the return of Christ is. Uh, might even involve, you know, some of those hailstones would be a byproduct of thermonuclear war. But all that doesn't matter. What does matter is what the Lord wrote us. And the first thing is, look at verses 1 through 6 of chapter 19. This is the run-up to the second coming of Christ. After these things are a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. This is before the second coming. Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord. Look at verse 3. Alleluia, verse 4. Amen, alleluia. Wow, look at verse 6. Alleluia. For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Wow. This is the same word in the Old Testament, hallelujah. 144 times in the Bible. In verse 1 to 6, we have four of them. The most concentrated pattern of them uh, in the New Testament. It's actually an imperative, meaning praise God. And what is being praised is Christ's salvation. That's what they say in verse 1. His coming judgment, verses 2 and 3. The worship of Christ, 4 and 5. And that he's the sovereign, conquering king of the universe. And so, notice what they say in 4 to 6. It's a reaffirmation. If you remember that very first week we were together, I showed you that God wants to frame all of our problems in that little box by his, remember, he loves us. He's powerful enough to keep anything out of the box, his attributes. He knows what's coming before we do it, and he's with us, and I showed you that. They're, they're doing the same thing. They're saying uh, that they say, Alleluia, praise our God, and look at verse 6. The Lord God omnipotent reigns. Nothing's coming into my life that he doesn't allow, and he is actively working it together for good, and I just need to trust him. Now look at verse 7. I, this is what gets very exciting. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. I personally believe that this is the launch of the thousand-year meal. And the thousand-year meal is going to happen right after the second coming of Christ because it's the millennium. And the millennium, I mean, have you ever wondered what we're going to be doing? Well, it says that Jesus said that we're going to help him and that the, the 12 apostles are sitting on the thrones and Paul said that believers were going to be judging uh, people in, in the future. They were going to be like judges, appointed judges. You know, our whole Supreme Court, we just confirmed the new one. Well, we're going to be on God's supreme, you know, judging and, and working on the earth. But this is what I wrote. The church plus the Old Testament saints are all going to gather for a meal and it might last all the thousand years. Do you know what Jesus said? In Matthew 8, 11, when Jesus was sharing the gospel with the Jewish people in chapter 8 of Matthew, he said, many are going to come and sit down at the table. In other words, a lot of people through the gospel are going to get saved. He compared getting saved and going to heaven to going to a banquet. But he said, when they get saved and they get to heaven and they sit down at the banquet, they're going to sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know what he said? When we get saved, we join all the saints. You know, sometimes we're only thinking about the church. Have you ever thought about the way God lays out heaven? The gates and the foundations merge together the apostles and the 12 tribes. Heaven is when God puts all saints together. And it's not like one group of saints are better than the other group of saints or whatever. Many will come from the east and west. Many will sit down, Jesus said, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I wrote this. Are you getting ready for the ultimate banquet? The greatest party is coming. The king of kings is preparing a wedding feast like none other. It's the most breathtaking location imaginable. The greatest names of all time will be present and seated. At dinner, the invited guest will be rubbing shoulders with Adam and his lovely wife, Eve. One of the twin sons, Abel, will be sitting with them as well as Seth, and his wife, not too far away, will be the amazing preacher, the earliest known prophet, Enoch. The great-grandson of Noah, his family will be nearby. On down the long table will be the likes of Job and his clan. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, their family members. What a reunion. Moses and Elijah are walking around talking to the guests and visiting with old friends. 
And there's Jeremiah sitting in rapt attention with Daniel and Isaiah and Ezekiel. They're pointing out all the stuff they saw in their prophecies that's about the banquet hall. But what we're going to wear is in the text. Now look at this. Look at verse 8. Then to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saint. You ever notice that verse? Right now, by your choices, to either say no to sin and say yes to Christ or not is determining what you're going to wear. That is, should be sobering. Our progressive, this is what I wrote in my devotional notes, our progressive sanctification will be seen forever. Revelation 19.8, we wear our good works for eternity, what we did for Christ and the power of the Spirit for the glory of God. So it really does matter how we live. And then after all that, we get to wear our outfits of our life as we follow Christ. That's what happens next.